Good morning, everyone. It's time for us to begin, so let's find our places and let's get ready to worship the Lord together. For this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So we want to just open up by looking to the word of the Lord, and Sister Bercy is coming to share a word from the scriptures. I'm reading from Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy regarding Christ. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. Smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. i 
So we fell in love with another new song that we're going to try out on you this morning. Um, but uh, I just wanted to tell you, when we first started listening to this song, I listened to an interview with the people who wrote this song, and they were talking about how the, the immediate reception was a little harsh because they talked about the devil in the song. And some people were saying, you know, don't even give him enough glory to even talk about him. But this song is about as, asking Jesus to remind the devil of his rightful place, which is under his feet, and where our battle is, which is Jesus' battle that has already been won. And so we're going to talk about the devil this morning, but in the context of him being under the feet of Jesus Christ. You 
Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise his name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. We've come to prayer time in our service. And today we want to continue to pray for Sister Dolores Frankel as she continues to recover. Also, we pray for Sister Elizabeth Braxton, who had surgery and is recovering. Also, I'm sure there are many other needs among us today. I want us to pray for our nation. We need revival. We need God to intervene into this nation. Not only our nation, it's around the world. We need revival. Would you join me in prayer right now? Father, we just come to you today in the holy name of Jesus. And Lord, we want to thank you for the privilege that we have to worship you today in spirit and in truth. That we may come together on a day like this and proclaim the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're in our midst. Today we pray for those who need healing. We ask that you would continue your healing process in their bodies. Make them completely whole and well. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And today, Lord, we pray for our nation. This nation needs revival. God, we need you today to intervene. And you promised us in your word that if your people would call upon you and that we would seek your face and that we would turn from our wicked ways, that you would forgive our sins and you would heal our land. Our land needs healing, Lord. And we've come today asking you, Lord, to intervene. Thank you, Father. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. We welcome you into this service today. When you came in, I hope that on the seat near you there was a connection card and we would like for you to put your name on the card and uh, if you're a guest with us today, if you're visiting, especially if you're first time, we'd like to have your address that we may correspond with you and let you know how delighted we are that you came to worship with us today. Met a family that came in this morning. They just recently moved from Massachusetts. All right, we welcome you from Massachusetts. Glad that you're worshiping with us here at First Assembly today. Amen. We're preparing to receive our offering, and uh, our ushers will be coming now to receive the offering. We want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Throughout this time, God has been faithful to his church, and he has met our needs, and we praise God for that today. He's still on the throne. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing upon us, and now as we give today, we pray your blessing upon this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning for our offertory, we're singing one of my favorites. It, the words will be on the screen. If you don't find them there, it's page number 316 in your hymnal. And it simply says this, it is well with my soul. Will you join us as we sing together? <clears throat>
worship team for bringing us into the presence of the Lord. This morning we have a very, 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 very special guest in our service. He's a personal friend of mine and a friend to this church. He's the pastor of Momentum, Pastor Tim Payne. Pastor Tim Payne, would you come and join me? <laughs> And you have been watching online. Let me just tell you that the cameras that have been bringing that to you are a gift from this man and his church. Man, I love you. Let's get you a microphone. I want you to say something to the people. Let's see, where is it? It's right here. Goodness, I should have brought it with me. I knew I was going to do this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Scruggs. I love Pastor Scruggs. I hope that you guys know how privileged and honored that it is to have a pastor like Pastor Scruggs. I was back there and I was just thanking the Lord for him, for his heart. I'm telling you, my dad's a pastor. I've grown up in church all my life. And I'm telling you, Pastor Scruggs is one of a kind. And I thank God for this man. I thank God for this man. He's a man of God. He's a man of God. I'm so thankful, Pastor, for your love for God. I'm thankful for the fact you talk about unity is what this country needs. Yes. Right? Amen. And I love the verse you quoted. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, we'll never pray till we humble ourselves. We'll humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. And when you seek God's face, you can't help but turn from your wicked ways. And I love that promise. And you're leading us in that. And I appreciate you so much. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's so good. I was getting God bumps back there just worshiping with you guys and looking forward to that. And uh, thank you so much. I love you, Pastor Scrubs. Love you God too, bless man. you. Thank God bless you. you. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Well, I have a lot of things on my mind today. At the close of our worship service, we're going to have a very brief uh, business meeting for the membership of the church. And of course, we're getting all of those things in place. And I came out and practiced the uh, song that we were going to sing together. It is well. And I left my Bible and everything laying on my desk. That's why I called Jane. I go to the office and get my Bible so I can preach this morning. All right? While she's doing that, I would like to convey a message to you from Brother Mike Holloway's brother. Brother Steve Holloway has said he wants to express thanks to this church for praying for him. If it had not been for the prayers of people like the people in First Assembly, he would not be with us today. God spared his life and uh, brought him back from the very clutches of death. And we thank God for Brother Steve Holloway still being in the land of the living. Amen? Praise God. So God is good. God is good all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you, of all the people I've ever had work with me in my office over the years, there's never been one to top Jane Foster. She is just at the top of the list. Thank you so much. This morning, I'm going to address the church about a sin that I believe that we need to acknowledge that is prevalent in our world. It is not a popular subject that I'm about to go into, and some would probably say, oh man, you're really brave to 
address this. No. Just that I believe that God is pleased with me addressing this. And I'm going to preach to you this morning as the Lord has laid on my heart concerning the sin of racism. The sin of racism. When we talk about racism, people have all different kinds of reactions. Racial prejudices have existed time immemorial. That doesn't make it right. Just because that somewhere down the line someone did something that caused things to be shifted and turned in a different direction, it does not make it right for us to hold in our heart any kind of racist ideas or prejudices. And I want you to know today that it's not just a southern problem. It is a national problem. It is not just a national problem, it's a world problem. And furthermore, it's not just a problem among people, it is a spiritual problem. And we're going to address it that way this morning. I'm going to take you to a verse of Scripture, a couple of verses. In Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 26 through 29, and I'm reading from the New King James. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He is recognizing that they are part of the body of Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now listen very carefully to verse number 28 because this is the key verse that I want to come in on. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm getting just a little bit of a ring. Bring it down just a little. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I am not going to try to resolve the racial problems in the world this morning. I want to ad address the racial problem in the church. We can stand in our church and feel comfortable and feel like everything is okay. We're fine. We have no problems. It's okay. We have a few token black people in our congregation who are not just like us, and so we can say we're not racist. The fact that we allow people that are not of the same color as we are to come and sit in our congregation doesn't address the issue that may be in our heart. And that's where I want to go this morning. The events of this last week have torn, a, torn apart and torn open an old wound that is not wanting to heal. There is so much wrong in all of this. There are those who rightfully should have their voices heard, but that is being blurred by the violence and looting and rioting and all the other things that are going on with it. I have never lived 
in the skin of a black man. I can say I know how you feel, but truthfully, I really don't. During this time, I've truly searched my heart to see if there is any part of racial prejudice left in me. You say left in you. Yeah, left in me. I was raised in South Alabama. And this morning, I could very well say, well, you know what? This is just the way I was raised, and this is the way it's always going to be, and I can't help it. Well, the fact is that I was born in sin. Am I going to say, well, that's just the way I was raised, and I can't help it? The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from racial sin. Hallelujah. Racial prejudice is not a new thing. It has existed in the world for ages of time. The Jews felt that they were superior to all other races. Anyone who was not a Jew was considered a Gentile and was not welcome among them. Yet the Jews, on the other hand, have been hated and targeted by so many groups over the years. Just think what Hitler did to the Jewish people. I think today as we look upon our own land, the Native Americans were greatly mistreated by those who came here. We can't go back and make everything right. We can't relive the past. We can't pay for the sins of our forefathers. But this morning what we can do is learn from their mistakes and learn from their sin and say with God's help, we're not going to be taken into that sin and led on down the road with that sin. We're going to break that curse and we're going to be free from all of that. Hallelujah. Jesus crossed the racial barrier when he ministered to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Let me go to John chapter 4 with you. You remember the story. Jesus had need to go through Samaria. And he comes and he sits down by the well. And there's a woman that comes out to draw water. Look at verse 7 of chapter 4. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How is it that you're doing this? we got two problems here. First of all, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Second of all, you're a man and I'm a woman. And because of that, we are not supposed to have interaction. We're not supposed to be talking to each other. And here you have asked me for a drink of water. You know the rest of the story. Jesus begins to talk to her about living water. And here he speaks of worship with this woman who was a sinner. And he talks to her about a time when people would call upon the name of the Lord and it wouldn't matter which mountain they were in when they called upon him. It wouldn't matter what the place was. It wouldn't matter what the time was. But they were going to worship him in spirit and in truth. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And I'm sure there were people who could not believe that any Samaritan could be good. How could Jesus tell a story that's going to make a Samaritan look like the good person in the story? Jesus has a way of... Breaking down those 
built up prejudices. In Acts chapter 10, God prepares Peter to go and preach to the Gentiles by giving him a vision. You remember? He goes up on the rooftop waiting for them to get lunch prepared. And while he's up there, there is a sheet that comes down from heaven. On the sheet, there were all kinds of animals on the sheet. And the voice that came to him said, Peter, rise up, kill, and eat. And what did he say? Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Don't you even talk to me about that. I don't do that. Now, was Jesus or was God trying to break down all of the things that had to do with the Levitical law at this point and and the dietary law and so forth. No, he was trying to teach him a lesson. For he said to him, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this happened three times. Have you ever wondered why it happened three times? I think it didn't take the first time. God did it again. It's not sure that it took this time. The third time. Notice how many times in the scripture there are threes that are mentioned. Three days, three times. So many times. Three is very significant here. But look look with me in Acts chapter 10. And I want you to see in verse number 34. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. And it says this, as Peter gets to Cornelius' house and he's ready to preach to them, it says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. In the King James Version, it says, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. He does not show partiality. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse number 11. And we have this truth uh, again reiterated for us. As we see him saying, For there is no partiality with God. God doesn't show favoritism. Galatians chapter 2, verse 6 says, God shows personal favoritism to no man. God doesn't love me any better than he loves you. He is not going to do for me more than he will do for you. He is ready and willing to do for each and every one of us the same if we will make ourselves available to him. The gifts of God are available to to us. So today, we realize that there is a great racial divide between the Jews and the Arabs, between Israelis and the Palestinians. I had this come very much uh, to me on one of our trips to the Holy Land. And uh, on that particular trip, we were staying in a hotel in Bethlehem. And our Jewish guide could not and would not go with us to the hotel in Bethlehem because it's in Palestinian territory. And she knew that she would not be welcome there. And there's no telling what might happen to her if she showed her face there. So there's this tension that is there between them. In the Hispanic community, the Mexicans are looked down on. I didn't realize that so much until I brought in a Hispanic pastor in North Carolina. And he was from Costa Rica. And most of the Hispanic people that we were wanting to reach in our community were Mexicans. 
But come to find out, he refused to go into the home of any Mexican and certainly would not eat any food that they prepared because there was no way that they were going to have anything to do with Mexicans. I never realized that Hispanics could have racial divides between them. Is that true, Brother Fred? True, Brother Alvarez? True. I got some wonderful Hispanic people right here in our congregation. Thank God for them. Amen. Hallelujah. There has been a great deal of injustice throughout the world. Let me just tell you this. God wants us to be one race. The human race. One race. We are to be one people. We are to live together and love and respect one another. We need to realize that it's not just the way that some people are. We need to call it what it is. The racial issues, the racial prejudice, the racial hatred is sin. For hatred of any kind is sin. The Bible says, how can you say that you love God whom you have not seen if you do not love your brother whom you have seen? Let me take you to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. And you're going to see it there. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar, no matter what color his brother is. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And we don't pick and choose who we're going to love and who we're not going to love. There are some people that are easier to love than other people. Some people make it hard for you to love them. Some people are just a grouch. Amen. Some people are just all the time grumpy. And anything you say, they're going to jump all over you. So I think we've got a problem. We need to love everybody, no matter who they are, where they came from, what their background is, what their economic status is. No matter, we must love one another. Now this morning, I think we can all agree that Mr. George Floyd should not have been killed by the police officer. No one should be killed in this way, no matter what skin color he is. You know, when they said George Floyd uh, had a flashback, had a very dear African-American friend in North Carolina whose name was George Floyd. In fact, uh, his son and my daughter were in the same class together and became very, very close friends. His name was Madre. Wonderful young man. Now I'm going to really have some of you up in arms. If my daughter had come home to me and said to me, Dad, I've fallen in love with Madre, and I want your blessing. We want to get married. Boy, it's quiet in here. Huh? Now what you're going to do? What you're going to do when it comes home to you? What are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? How are you going to answer it? Well, I'll tell you. I had a young black man in my church there that uh, became like an adopted son to me. He and my son were in the same class together, and he was a star football player, and he became part of our church, and 
and, and he just became a part of us. And uh, he always made uh, little comments, and he said, I'm the black sheep in the family. But uh, I loved him dearly. And uh, so one time, whenever uh, some of the white mothers became concerned that he might be looking at their daughters, uh, I brought him in and I talked to him. And I said, you know, I just want to talk to you about this. There are some of the ladies in the church that their white daughters are hanging around with you and they're a little bit concerned that, that you're going to fall in love with their daughter and that's going to cause all kind of issues and I just want to talk to you about that. He looked at me and he said, Pastor, you don't understand. What I think is a beautiful woman is a beautiful chocolate woman. Let it go back. What if I had been faced with that? Here's what I would have done. I would have sat down with them and I would have said, I want you to recognize the problems that you're going to encounter in life. I want you to recognize the issues that you're going to have to face. Furthermore, if you have children, I want you to recognize the problems your children are going to face in this society. But if you love one another and you promise to take care of one another and you're going to live together after after God's ordinance, then you have my blessing. And I mean that. I mean that with all my heart. I'm sure that George Floyd was not a perfect man. Who of us is? But I was so thankful did any of you happen to see the memorial service that was on for Mr. Floyd uh, this week? I hope that some of you did. The service was held in the chapel of North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is an Assemblies of God college. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The lady who opened the service was Robin Wilkerson. Her husband, Rich Wilkerson, pastors Trinity Church in Miami. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm thankful that North Central University and its leadership was not holding back from making their facility available to these people, to this family, to reach out to minister to this family that is hurting. No matter what the situation was, no matter what kind of life he may have lived in the past, he was somebody's son. He was somebody's brother. He was somebody's loved one. And they cared for him. And thank God for people who would reach out out to love on him dear live on them during this time we must address this issue as a sin problem and when we do i think we've got to address it on this level in a, in the book of ephesians chapter 6 Paul talks about spiritual warfare. He tells us to put on the whole armor of God. And all of the armor is spelled out for us there. It's a wonderful passage. But I like verse 12 of chapter 6 of Ephesians. And it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This morning we've got to recognize that we're dealing with a spirit. It is a demonic spirit. It is a spirit that seeks to divide. It is a spirit that seeks to destroy. 
We must recognize it for what it is and for who it is. And when we come against the spiritual wickedness that has risen up in our face, we need to take a stand and say, as a child of God, we will not stand for that. We're going to raise our voice and say, it is a sin. We will not condone it. We're going to do our part to make things better. With all the things that have gone on this week, all the protests, all the marches. By the way, it came, came home to me in that my daughter in Philadelphia, her, her store was looted. She's the lead manager of the Apple computer store in downtown Philadelphia. She watched on her computer screen as the closed circuit TV cameras recorded everything that was happening. She watched it in live time. She said, Dad, to start with, everything within me was just breaking apart. Because it, I looked at that store and it, I had poured my life into that store for the last seven years. And everything that I had worked for and everything I'd built, I just see it going from me. But by Monday, she says, all of that is behind me and that doesn't even mean anything. Apple can restore all that stuff and put it back in place. What I'm dealing with are my workers, my team, who are breaking, their heart is broken, the pressure that is there, all the things that are going on. And she says, I've just been saying to them, I'm here for you. I love you. This week, don't worry about clocking in. They weren't back in their building anyway, but they were checking in with her online. She has 150 employees. Don't worry about trying to get in touch with me. Spend time with your family. Do what you need to do. And don't worry about whether you're going to be able to pay the rent because you're going to be paid just the same as you've been being paid all through this whole thing. And then she said to me, Dad, I want to thank you that you did not raise us to be racist, even though we were in a community that was full of it. And it was even in the church. She said, you never raised us to have those feelings. I said, honey, I want you to know what you're doing with those people right now. You're pastoring them. You're reaching out to them to let them know that you're there for them. This morning, I pray that First Assembly will live up to its slogan of being an oasis of love and that we will continue to love and that we will love everybody of every race, every ethnicity, of every background. It doesn't matter. We will love. And we will love people as they are. We're not going to try to change them in order that we can love them. We will love them and pray that God will change whatever needs to change. But at the same time, He'll change us. Because a lot of times, what needs to change is what's inside of me. So may we go forward. The last verse that I have is John chapter 10 and verse 10. 
And it says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is the giver of life. He is the one who comes to heal. He comes to bring order in the midst of chaos. Oh, this world is so messed up. I have really struggled with whether I would share with you what a dear friend of mine, pastor friend in North Carolina posted on Facebook. But I felt like that it needed to be. He's a black pastor, highly respected in the community. He and I were best of friends. He preached in my pulpit many times. I preached in his pulpit many times. The last Easter that I was in North Carolina, I preached their sunrise service. This is what my dear pastor friend wrote, and he said this, Whites, please help me. I am not white. I don't pastor a white congregation. I don't know what it feels like to be white. I don't understand what it feels like to be white and not to always be looked at suspiciously no matter your age or profession. I don't know what it feels like to be white and not hold your breath while your son is out at night for fear that he is being profiled. I don't know what it means to be white and say, there is not a racist bone in my body when it is really in my heart. I don't know why it is so easy to be white and search for justification to see white as right when a black person is involved. I don't know what it feels like to be white and always be, be given preference and have unstated privileges. But it feels great. I don't know what it feels like to be white and in abject denial about your deeply rooted racist tendencies and actions no matter how many black friends you have. I don't know what it feels like to be white and feel justified in having religion that brings no conviction to discrimination and a sense of supremacy. I don't, I don't understand what it feels like to be a white pastor who knows racism is wrong but feels reluctant to preach it, preach on it for fear of congregational repercussions and rejection. I don't know what it is to be white and get satisfaction in telling black people to get over it. I really don't know what it feels like to be white and see white police officers continue to kill blacks and say they deserved it. Now you understand that everybody is not in all of that together, but we have to recognize that there is much that is true there. I do know what it feels like to be a black man and have to live with many whites what, with what many whites refuse to acknowledge and deal with. God does not agree with this sinful behavior. Help. It hurts. You understand that racial prejudice can come from both directions.
It's not just a white person's issue. It is a black person's issue as well. There are black people who just are just as racist as any white person has ever been. But that doesn't make any of it right. This morning, what I'm calling for is that our church will address the issue. And whatever it is that causes us to be divided and separated from our brothers and sisters who are of a different culture, from a different background, of a different race, that we will be delivered from any of that because inside we're the same. It's just the outside that's different. God help us. I never could understand why we as Assemblies of God people who are so missions minded would send missionaries across the world to win black people in Africa and Jamaica and various places of the world and we would turn our backs on the black people in America. Something is wrong with that picture. I'm just asking that we will repent before God. I'm not asking you to repent for what your forefathers did. I'm asking you to repent if there's something in you. We can't go back and correct all of that. But we can go forward with the right heart and the right attitude. Because I want to see people in Pensacola one to Jesus Christ no matter what color they are. No matter what background they are. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, I pray that you will take this word and indelibly print it in our hearts. And God, that we would not reject the word. If it's coming to bring conviction, we will allow it to bring conviction, but that we won't gloss over it and just pretend that everything is all right. Lord, that we will repent before you and begin to do differently than we've done, begin to think differently than we've thought, to talk differently than we've talked. God, that we will walk in the way that is pleasing to you. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to stand together these next few moments. We're going to transition. This morning, if there is anybody here in the congregation that feels like that you need to talk to me concerning what I have preached, I want you to know my door is open. My phone is open. I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to hear. And I will listen. I will listen. I don't want anything to hinder us from going forward as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, I pray your blessing on this congregation this morning. As we prepare to go from here, we ask that you will keep us. And Lord, that you will go before us and go with us. You're my brother, you're my sister.